Hi everyone, thanks Steve, thanks Kamal and everybody else for the invite to talk here. Um, as, as sort of Steve and everyone else has alluded to, I'm a, um, I actually have my own company now, but I'm, I was working with Steve a while ago, but I also work as a heritage consultant with Steve um, and the guys at Solius. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the project. It was actually my last project with the company and, and some of my swan song. Um, but before we get there, I just want to talk to you a little bit about um, sort of how I got to this position to be able to sort of have, have this project with the British Museum. Um, a number of years ago, um, I, I worked in collaboration with um, the, the uh, Royal um, Historic Institute of Monuments of Wales. Um, they, they had a pilot project where what they wanted to do is they wanted to take data, um, cultural data, historical data, um, that's difficult to, to get to from archives, um, from, from people's heads, from people within Wales, and put it onto an online, um, an online library to give people access to data that wasn't readily available to these people. And as a pilot project, um, we took Barty Island, um, a small island off the, off the coast of Wales that had five significant developments during its history based on, um, based on the, the, the influence of religion on the island. Um, as part of this, we basically took, took information from a book that was written in Wales that only had a, a publication of about 50 people, sort of a normal academic book. And, um, and we, we, we took that and we made it available to the wider audience by analysing that information and then making a series of animations out of it. Um, the most important things about this is, is and I think the, the fundamental one is historical accuracy. There's no point doing projects like this if it's not historically accurate. But you have to also be sub, sub, uh, sort of sympathetic to the sub subject matter, but you've also got to make it engaging because it doesn't matter how good it is and how historically accurate it is if people aren't going to get entertained by it, if people aren't going to get educated by it. So going back to, um, to some of the things that have been picked up in the earlier, um, in the earlier talks, um, there's always a problem with the interpretation of historical data and um, sort of alluding to the idea of taking um, sort of pictures, paintings and seeing sort of how, how they relate to modern life. This was a map that we used for the field boundaries on the island. Uh, this is the Ordnance Survey map overlaid over the top of it. As you can see, there's not a lot of, uh, of sort of uh, collaboration between the two images. There's also, a, a, as you can see, sort of right here, there's an abbey on the island. This is the only image ever of the abbey on the island. We know where this church is on the mainland. When you superimpose the actual island over the top of it, you can't actually see the abbey. So there's interpret you know, some artistic interpretation that has to be taken into account. After doing that project, I was lucky enough to, um, to be involved in, in modelling the Glasgow City model. This was a sort of cutting edge um, project where, where we modelled um, sort of two different, mod two different layers of information over, over, over Glasgow. This is a fully architectural visualisation of the whole of Glasgow City Centre. Um, it was about a three year project and um, when we started it, we, we were using photogrammetry as a technology to, to capture this data. Um, we realised at the time photogrammetry was practically useless as a known floor in a building, not a very long building, fell by one and a half metres while we were using photogrammetry. We knew that, that we knew the floor was straight, so um, we ended up uh, buying a, a fairly early laser scan, laser scanning the whole area. Um, it was um, it was going to be verified by a surveyor, so we had to make sure the information was accurate. So going back to this this idea of historical accuracy, and then. Um, we were lucky, I mean, the technical innovation that we, we made on this project, um, we, we got a BAFTA for, which is quite cool. Um, but also, not only that, the, the, the groundbreaking work that we did on this and the methodology we, we put in place has become the foundation of the Scottish 10 Glasgow School of Art project, where they're going around and laser scanning and documenting um, umpteen different buildings around, the, the historical significant buildings around the world. Going on from this laser scanning, I'm also involved currently at a, a, on a project in Rome where we're doing laser scanning of the um, of a, a Roman sort of scarvy, an area of caverns underneath the basilica, um, which allows a number of things. But it's, it's all again based on historical um, information. And what we can do with this information is going in with the laser scanner. We can then challenge or verify preconceived ideas by historians and academics. And then we can disseminate this information using visualizations, but these visualizations are based on um, what we know about Roman architecture at the time, what we know about uh, the, the actual data that we've gone in and, and analyzed in terms of the laser scan. And once again, with the, um, 
with the sort of like the David Roberts paintings, um, there is one fresco that we know of the interior of the, the, the original Constantine Basilica, but that fresco was done um, sort of 200 years after the Constantinian Basilica was demolished. So the only fresco that we know of the existence of it is a visualization, an early form of visualization, was already 200 years after the building um, was no longer with us. When we then take this information, we can start using it for sort of practical purposes. Things like um, the, the project Virtual Medieval Newcastle, where, we, where we're looking at Medieval Newcastle from the point of view of the, the merchant classes, but using the same technology uh, that Steve was talking about, we can, we can augment that and actually have people walking around and viewing the city um, from within, within the actual uh, ge geological space. And the same, that, that north onto Hadrian's Wall, where we've done the same thing for, for a length of Hadrian's Wall. So, after a number of projects like this that have developed into, from initial visualisation all the way through to, to using augmented reality and using uh, geolocation, all based on accurate data, I was lucky enough to be talking um, at a conference in Wales about this idea and about the idea of this wall, you know, a wall of, of, of data. And so, the whole ethos of, of Solius Heritage is we have a series of um, end users and stakeholders, you know, perhaps they're academics that need access to data, uh, perhaps the data is in the form of, of education, perhaps it's in the form of virtual tourism. That information, the end user could be any, anybody, they don't necessarily have to have technological skills. And on the other side of that we have the data that we've captured and the teams go in and capture so much detail and there's going to be on virtual pyro potentially laser scanning, there's going to be a lot of academic work. And this is all going to be held, in, held as, a, as, a, as a unit of data. And so the idea is, is using technology, and using modern technology, we break down that wall and we allow the end user, the people that need access to that data, we give them access to that data in a usable form. So they don't need to go and learn computer programs, they don't need to learn how to animate, they don't need to learn how to model, all they need to, to know how to do is sort of walk around the space or wear goggles or play with their smartphone. So, as you go through this, the model develops and it builds until you have a, a, a fairly serious chunk of data. I mean, some of these models, if you, if you put in metadata in them and things like that, can be absolutely vast. When you have that central data source, there's like an explosion of that data source onto different apps. So we have things like the traditional ways of doing it, the animations, like the, the original sort of virtual pyro, we have images and, and visualizations that can show it in a very basic way. But then we can have things like virtual reality, augmented reality, and domes where people go in and actually experience those spaces for themselves. And you can back that up with applications. So if you've got metadata, the application itself um, can be a way of deep mining that data that you may not necessarily get from, from something as simple as a visualization. Luckily, in the audience at the time was um, Gino Ray and Lizzie Edwards from the British Museum, the work at the SDDC at the British Museum. They, um, they quite liked what I was talking about with this breakdown of data um, and, and breaking down this wall. And so we had a chat afterwards and, and we decided we'd do a project together. Um, the, the SDDC themselves are, uh, that were formed in 2009 and they're one of the biggest um, sort of digital education bodies within any museum, especially in Britain. And what they do is they take children in school groups and they use digital technology as a way of um, engaging them with, with the, the museum's collections, uh, educating them on history, and basically trying to, to, to get um, an audience participation from a demographic that wouldn't normally be that interested in museums. So we came up with a series of, of, of ideas. In fact, um, Myself and, and one of my colleagues at Solius, Alex Strachan, um, sat down and brainstormed a number of ideas prior to our, our first initial meeting with, with, um, with the SDDC. And, um, and we thought, some of them we thought were brilliant but way out there, and some of them we thought were, were, were sort of slightly more accessible to them. So things like a, a, a multi user augmented reality display, it's been done sort of kind of, it's been done before. Um, this is a, a, a display where you, the users look at a screen, but it only, it only works from one point of view. But they look at a screen, and they're on, a, a, on an iceberg, and then killer whales come up, and a polar bear walks around the corner, and 
because they're looking at the screen, it looks like these things are near them, but actually if they look around, there's nothing but space around them. So we thought we could do that to take it to the next level, where you actually have multiple users engaged in the space together and, and sort of experiencing things. So, so we thought about projects like, you know, wouldn't it be good for a multi-user experience to actually walk through the time when the pyramids were being built? Or wouldn't it be good to put yourself within one of the famous battles and actually see the battle going on around you while you all experience that as a team? Um, excuse me a minute, it's quite hot. Now, I'm from a very cold country. Um, another thing that we sort of uh, we, we, we sort of had an idea of was a journal app, and, and we thought this app would be quite entertaining because you could actually walk around a massive museum. You know, take take something the size of um, the museum you have here in here in Cairo, or just down the road in Cairo, quite a long way down the road. Um, the idea that you could walk around it and it would give you information as you walked around it to supplement your your visit to, to the museum. So. Things like, um, I mean, we, we promoted this originally to the British Museum, so we, we thought there's, there's key objects within the British Museum that um, the people want to go and see. And we thought, if you want to go and see these things, you could put it in your app, and it could give you a journey through the, to the museum, the, the best journey through the museum. But also using something like an Amazon-style recommends, it will go, well, actually, if you're interested in this artifact, then what about this one? You know, you might not have heard of this one, but it's equally as important, you should go and see this, and show you the route to, to go through it. It could also do things like uh, generate school content for, um, for things like reports. And even remembered multiple visits back to the museum. So when you've been to the museum once, so the second time you go to the museum, how about going and seeing these objects? These are important parts of history. I think the most way out there kind of idea we came up with was a, a creation-based augmented reality game, a bit like, um, th there's loads out there. I mean, Age of Empires was one of the first ones with settlers and things like that. And I think that there's a new one that's advertised on TV in England all the time, where you basically go down a, a, a sort of um, a technology tree creation path to try and get bigger and bigger sort of buildings, bigger and bigger weapons or whatever it is. Um, and then everybody fights each other. But well, we thought you could use that as a way of going around the museum to actually educate kids. So the further they got around the museum and learned about the development of civilization through all the different periods, the further they got on that technology tree. And then they put all that technology together into a virtual robot, and then within the main hall of the British Museum, using augmented reality, the robots had some sort of battle royale, and one group at the end of it was, was the winner. Um, it went down okay, but they didn't like the idea of the conflict particularly. So, the one that is most based on the actual project we did is using things like uh, gear VR headsets and, and augmented reality to basically paint a picture to give life back to objects. So for example, you can, you can take an object and have it as a tracker and you can paint in a background to that object that puts that object back into its original context as a way of sort of educating people onto its use. <coughs> so the key prime objectives of this project were to explore the potential of virtual reality within the British Museum and also to engage with family audiences that are the key values of the SDDC. Um, I think that um, the, the, one of the things that was very apparent right at the start is they didn't want to make a virtual museum. So the idea is you go in and look around a museum as you would do a normal one, even though there are benefits to that because you, there's no real like real estate on a virtual app, so you can bring everything out of the archives that people don't normally see. But with this, it was to create sort of a completely different experience. So we came up with a, a sort of intelligent, multi-platform, um, sort of immersive experience for, for, for the users, and um, and we wanted it to be uh, we wanted it to be specifically based on our, on our audience, which was children and family groups. We wanted it to use the expertise of the curator and other experts in the field, and to save a bit of money on the project to use existing assets. And so we came up with the idea of using the Bronze Age. And the idea was that we'd use the Bronze Age, um, Bronze Age um, England as a basis for doing this project. One of the reasons being is that the, the British Museum, in partnership with, uh, let me just look this one up, uh, UCL, so University College of London Institute of Archaeology, they've done a crowdsourced photogrammetric um, sort of uh, archive of a number of objects both within the collection and within the archives. And so these are all on Sketchfab and you can go in and you can, and can look around these objects. So a few examples of them, the Sussex Lou bracelets, 
Um, there was a ceremonial dirk. This is a dagger that was never actually used. It never actually had a hilt attached to it. And uh, if it works, oops, just went past that one. A Wollaston gold bracelet. But the big question of these things, what were they for? No one really knows what they were for, so it was there as a way of engaging with the audience and trying to get them to sort of talk through their experiences as part of the, um, as part of the project. And this was a great quote by the curator on the project. Um, I'll let you read it yourselves, there's no point me reading it out to you, see it from the back. But it basically went in line with everything that they were key to, to promote at the museum, which is opening that, that experience of the museum to audiences that wouldn't normally engage with artefacts or with collections within a museum. So how did we actually go about the process? Well, like with everything else, it starts with the initial concept. So, so we were getting concept sketches and ideas back from the curator and sort of modelling these up. Luckily enough, just down the road in Scotland, not just down the road, um, in, in Brodick Country Park, the, the, the National Trust Ranger Service had built a replica Bronze Age roundhouse, which was brilliant because the team of modellers went there and sort of experienced it to get, get an idea of, of space, an idea of what the feel like is within, within, within the building, um, but also took a, a whole number of photographs. Um, the, having that knowledge of the, of, of the space, the intimacy of the space, became key to the experience that we were creating. And going in there and, and, and taking all, like, and it was a massive database of photos within the space, allowed us to start the process of modelling it. Even though our building was going to be on a different scale, it was going to be much bigger and have a, uh, have a landing within it, like a second floor within it. Um, we started the process of photogrammetry along the same process that was used with the, um, with the Micropass project to, to build up uh, a virtual representation of this building that's in existence. We then took the building that was in, in existence, using those, um, those same photographs as textures, we built our own uh, version of the environment. Um, this went through a few iterations with the curator at the British Museum and other experts in the field, and after discussions, we located the settlement in the corner of a cleared field, surrounded by woods. And this was key to the experience because um, the, the, the Bronze Age in England was a, it was a massive period of social upheaval. Um, it became the first time where people started enclosing land, the first sort of permanent structures of houses. So it led to the, the country that we have today, with ownership of land, um, with settlement, with, with divisions between people, and ultimately with conflict. So before that, conflict was just sort of a passing thing here. Conflict was about protecting yourself, protecting your land, protecting that one little asset that you had. So it's fundamental in the development of, of, sort of England and Britain as a, as a, as a, as a sort of culture. And um, this is the kind of the idea of the space that we came up with. At the same time, parallel to this, we developed the apps. And the apps went through a, series, a similar series of, of, uh, of storyboarding and uh, iterative sort of design with the, um, with the team at the British Museum. And um, eventually we came up with three distinct technologies, the ones that Steve mentioned to you already, uh, all about delivering sort of a, a multi-dimensional a multi but mutually um, supporting uh, experience. Yeah. So um, we had the Gear VR for immersive uh, individual, um, it, it sort of individual sort of immersive spaces. We had uh, the tablet where you could go in and, and you could analyse data in more detail. And we also had the Solus Immersive Full Dome where um, family groups could, you, could, could actually get together and look at it as, as a group. One of the advantages of doing this was even though we were, we were told we had to use the Gear VR by Samsung, it has a 13 year old my, like minimum age limit. And so if we're doing things for family groups, we need the other technology to, to sort of support it. Um, so, the, uh, the event itself culminated in a weekend in August of last year where we had a come and see, come and experience technology event within the British Museum. And instead of the normal 300 people that the team get to these events, we had over um, 1,200 people come to this event. And not only did we have the three technologies there, we supplemented it with, um, we actually had uh, 3D printouts of actual, uh, of the objects that people could touch. And we also engaged with, with, the, with the audience, engaged with the kids, and asked them what do you think this, the, these were used for, tried to get them engaged with it. And we also had special tours of the Bronze Age um, exhibit.